All right. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, hope you had a good day so far. Um, we'll start the start the webinar and the recording. And um, all right. So let's get going. All right. So the uh, topic for today is um, uh, you know the future of architecture. What we think um, you know is going to come to the fore. Um, and uh, you know basically um, as as related to the the audit software and 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 the industry how that, that relates um, my name is Shol and uh, Paul's also going to join me in the in the discussion um, uh, we're both from obviously micrographics all right so um, let's get going all right so the agenda for today is uh, just to introduce the topic uh, talking just about um, you know what uh, what we think um, and then uh, we'll uh, We'll then go through the agenda, which is uh, you know generative design. Uh, what is it? Um, and uh, looking at um, the AI uh, idea, uh, artificial intelligence, um, fabrication, model design, how that will impact um, you know the, the future. Um, also, uh, what we think um, you know 3D printing and uh, uh, that will be um, you know. Uh, uh, how that will affect it, uh, and then also look at the the new cloud-based systems, um, common data environment, and how that will will uh, you know, impact our uh, the future of architecture. Right. We'll also uh, look at a little bit of uh, uh, the virtual reality and how that will uh, work, and then uh, we'll 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 end off. All right. So um, just looking at the trends. Um, that we find in in the industry, um, you know, the uh, Autodesk is usually a trendsetter, and um, you know they 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 basically prepare the market or they prepare us to uh, um, you know the new things that that comes into uh, you know their their radar, and uh, you know that uh, we want to just share a little bit of that uh, with you. Um, um, basically, uh, all the trends and the technology, um, you know that uh, that they then design to uh, cater for these trends. All right. Right, so the first first thing is basically, uh, you know, gener generative design and AI. Um, uh, in its basic form, it's basically, um, you know, the computer computes things uh, that you, uh, you know, uh, want it to do. Um, but how does that impact and how does that work into our environment um, basically it's uh, um, with with typically Revit um, we've got a software called uh, Dynamo um, it is not only uh, linking to to Revit it links to uh, Civil 3D it links to AutoCAD as well um, and uh, um, other software I think Navisworks is also um, uh, able to do that and then uh, Format also can take uh, uh, Dynamo uh, scripts Okay, so what is Dynamo? Um, it's basically a set of smaller instructional packets that is str strung together to uh, to do a certain task. Now, that task can be anything. It can be a, um, a, a it can be objects that you create. Uh, it can be uh, tasks that you do automate, uh, meaning you can maybe take all the views in your your drawings and place them on sheets. You know, um, and uh, that task that you write or the uh, object that you create with this macro can be reused in future. So uh, you don't reinvent the wheel each time you work. Now, um, it started a couple of years ago, um, specifically Dynamo. Um, and uh, it's grown, as I mentioned, into more uh, pieces of software. And uh, so that's the backbone. These scripts and um, nodes that they create to and string together. The, this is the backbone of uh, uh, what uh, you know the software is going to look like in future. We think um, the next step to that, uh, these macros are generative design. Now um, the images on the left, as you can see there, there's a the couple of nodes that um, that uh, is placed together that does a certain task, 
and these are stringed together as you can see the little link um, uh, basically goes from from start to finish so maybe if this is the start uh, does certain things and then it goes to the next step does a certain number of things and goes to the next step and so so the tasks are strung together uh, to create a, a specific um, you know uh, object as you can see at the bottom uh, there's a little bit of a stadium um, seating or roof and uh, um, as you change the, the, the inputs uh, the output also adjusts all right now um, that is just a simple kind of predefined thing now with generative design and I'm going to give this over to Paul just to uh, uh, just chat a little bit about this but um, with generative design is um, you've got various um, factors that now becomes in, involved maybe um, like in the COVID in environment, we, we've got, uh, you know, social distancing, that's a factor. Uh, maybe lighting is a factor. Um, obviously, the, the space or the environment uh, that, you, that you place your desks in is a, is, is a factor, etc. cetera. But um, um, if I can just ask uh, Paul just to elaborate perhaps on, on just a little bit of a generative design and, and what he thinks about that. That's my pleasure, Shaul. Morning, everybody. So my personal experience with Dynamo in the construction industry was on a large hospital in the Middle East and I used Dynamo to automate some of the tasks that you might find on the production floor. And what's nice about Dynamo as well is whatever isn't available there you can also input with a Python script and then you can get access to the Revit API. Now, the main thing here, as you can see with those nodes on the left hand side, is that you've got inputs and outputs. And what generative design is, ultimately, it's based on a, a optimization engine, which is called refinery, is something that's called the refinery beta by Autodesk. And it is a mathematical construct, you could say a mathematical method to optimize problems where you have multivariable inputs and multivariable outputs. So you would essentially choose the range of outputs or the optimal output that you would uh, want. You would uh, then do a brute attack on the model. So it will be a computer running through a few thousand or hundred or however many steps you need to take through the model. And it will then come up with the optimal solution as you decide the optimal solution to be. So it's one step above Dynamo, but to put it in plain English, you can ask the model questions using Dynamo, and then you can optimize the answer from the model using Refinery. And it really is just a mathematical process through which the computer steps the questions that you ask of the model. And for that reason, there's very, you know, you can come up with anything that you really want to ask the model. However, they've already started building more functionality into the Revit software. So there are things like uh, space planning that you can see there with COVID. But a much more challenging question would be something like, how do I minimize the floor area or the footprint of a hospital? So if I have operating theatres, they are also dependent upon other auxiliary rooms, waiting rooms, washing up rooms, uh, hallways, and what have you. And based on some other rule structure, you would then like to have, say, five operating theatres. Now, what is the minimum amount of floor space that you would need for them? And so the programming becomes quite complex. And it is something where there's a great opportunity for mathematicians and statisticians to become involved as well as programmers over and above what uh, the architect or the BIM manager might ask of the model. So these can get very complex, but it's democratizing the access through uh, predefined modules that are also built into Revit now. Thanks, Sean. That's all from my side. Mm, great. Um, one thing to remember, though, is um, you know it's the user that inputs these rules, um, and it's the user that decides uh, which of the uh, you know the results he will select to use in the um, in the uh, um, you know in the building. Um, 
a lot of people say, oh, computers are going to take over the world, you know. Um, but um, I believe it's still there's still going to be uh, user input uh, to decide, um, you know, which factor is more important than other factors, um, you know, based on, um, you know, uh, these sort of uh, uh, results. Right. Um, when just carrying on with uh, with the uh, you know the, the artificial intelligence and smart buildings now, um, with with all these um, um, you know uh, computers and things coming in, um, the the Internet of Things um, where everything is connected, the sensors uh, in your homes, um, you know this will all be kind of uh, com combined with uh, you know the computers and uh, allow you know um, uh, the user experience in a building to be better perhaps um, uh, the shape of the building could be optimized as, uh, as Paul mentioned um, with regards to you know um, different factors um, and um, you know so um, we might see different shapes coming to the fore more computer generated shapes rather than you know squares and and, uh, and and circles, um, you know, and uh, that might um, you know lead into uh, into the future, as well as this all being connected to your cell phone or um, proximity sensors, etc. That uh, as you approach the gate, it opens up if it's your car, uh, uh, that sort of thing, and um, you know, as well as uh, um, you know, all these sensors that are tied in, and uh, things that you can just switch on and off with your with your, um, you know, phone and uh, devices. Right. Um, you know, that, Charles, uh, if I might chip in there yes. with regards mm -hmm. to smart cities as well. So what we do have these days are buildings with a lot of transducers that are built in. So what we are familiar with is a term now, if you haven't heard of it, it's called a digital twin. So the Revit model is ultimately used to build up a digital twin of that building. And then we will do maintenance on that building up to even predictive maintenance, where we might be measuring the input of water and electricity to key components to find out if something is going wrong with that component. And that data can be streamed using either a, a cell phone chip or whatever it is, and that data is then going to be transferred. So this is a very exciting future for architecture or for even city planning. And just the predictions that I've heard is to store the amount of data that 5G will help buildings and infrastructure and everything else generate, there will not be enough power on the planet by 2050. So it's a very exciting field where the, the management of data and the optimization of systems will depend upon the historical data that is generated by a building. So if you take a city, for instance, and you want to put a new building down, and the city planners can then, based on historical data of a building for the same type, predict what sort of infrastructure needs to be created for that building to exist within that city. So optimizing not only buildings, but also optimizing cities, and that is what they know as a smart city. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exciting, yeah, because, um, and, and more often than not, uh, that will also be decided with a, uh, you know, click of a button, uh, <laughs> with all those rules coming in. All right. Um, Okay, so uh, let's carry on with uh, with the uh, fabrication and uh, and uh, how buildings will be um, manufactured. Um, how we think, uh, you know, you know that's a trend that's coming into the fore, and uh, what we would think uh, will will uh, uh, will happen here. All right, um, basically, you know, windows and doors are already kind of manufactured off-site um, at in mass, and uh, you know. Uh, installed, uh, um, you know, on site. Now, um, this is just the next step. You know, the whole building. Um, most of these um, uh, um, units and uh, rooms in that would be uh, perhaps uh, uh, constructed and manufactured off site um, for various reasons. Um, I think a more controlled environment. You know, there's no rain. Uh, there's no um, um, you know um, adverse effects uh, you know uh, in the environment um, and uh, and it could also be option optimized and uh, more efficiently constructed with with uh, with uh, the the use of uh, of mechanical equipment and and robots and and that sort of thing um, that uh, creates these uh, objects and components um, very uh, um, uh, efficiently right and uh, this whole kind of idea specifically the uh, um, 
the efficiency and energy efficient uh, um, idea uh, is throughout this whole kind of uh, fabrication and even the design and uh, and uh, um, even 3D printing, but we'll get there. Um, so the idea here is uh, uh, this trend is growing and uh, and that will also allow objects and com computer programs like um, Inventor or even Fusion that will come into this whole ecosystem. Uh, these softwares will uh, are, are basically geared for uh, parts design so they will um, you know you'll create every nut and bolt and uh, um, it will then uh, uh, be able to cost that uh, you know even uh, building or part and uh, it will um, you can optimize you know the uh, the cost of the building uh, very quickly um, I don't know um, Paul if you want to add something there yeah so Robotics as well as prefabrication is very interesting. It's a topic that was already discussed at Autodesk University in 2016 where an example for instance was used of a structural assembly where the joints between a beam and a column would be effected using a dovetail joint and then one bolt to hold it in place. So that's an example of technology um, being brought on site and then used directly where it is supposed to be used very quickly just by tightening one bolt the dovetail joint will then create a friction and the building will stand. The argument with prefabricated buildings typically is that their lifespan isn't as long but if you think about how it is constructed even though the lifespan isn't as long there are other costs that are involved that the developer can recoup from that lifespan of that building including deconstruction and recycling of materials and that is a large part also of how we construct and how we deconstruct buildings. So instead of blowing it up and returning it into a state of rubble or maybe just knocking it down using some other uh, pneumatic hammer, we would then recycle those materials and put it into the circular reusing of materials. So concrete is a very big issue at the moment. Um, I know Bill Gates with his climate change, one of his big initiatives is also to create a more uh, environmentally friendly concrete and then on the robotic side as well, it is definitely more on the manufacturing side. I think one of the things that people are often not confused about, but uh, uninformed about and scared about is, I'm going to have a computer or a robot that's going to take over my work. But coming from an engineering background, maybe you are from an engineering background yourself, it is actually so that if we try and create order, we are guaranteed to create more disorder than the order we create. And therefore, it takes a lot of energy and input to maintain that order. So if you try and program and automate buildings and have machinery and prefabrication, the more efficiency you try and bring into the situation, it, it's actually going to create more work for other people. The work might just not be the same as what you are used to. So it might, you know, if we have robots, we need people to program them, we need people to service them and build them. It's, it's a very exciting future, which, you know, even though we're in South Africa, it still plays a role because everybody else is doing the same thing and that's how the future looks. So I'm personally very excited about this future and I'm confident also that it's going to create jobs and not destroy jobs. And so it's a very interesting and a, and a, a, and a great topic really where we are going with architecture going into the future. Great. Um, thank you very much. All right. So um, let's go over to the next um, part and that's, that's basically 3D printing. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, was, uh, it's came to the fore a while back, um, but it's now kind of democratized so that, you know, everybody, um, you know, can have a little 3D printer printing some small little objects in their, in their backyard uh, or, you know, in their, uh, you know, garage. Um, but in, in our sense, um, these 3D printing um, ideas are more for our modular uh, designs that we uh, can uh, um, print even um, and um, like the robots build it uh, this is just a different technology it might be more uh, efficient at uh, less efficient depending on um, uh, you know where you um, where you get to but um, as you can see in the um, the, the bot the top left uh, uh, picture there they they uh, pr uh, you know even they generative designed a little bridge a foot 
path or whatever and uh, these 3D printers actually print that. Uh, same with the desk and chair. Um, at the bottom um, uh, pictures are kind of large 3D printers that actually print walls and um, you know maybe fee prefabricate those parts and it gets assembled on site um, you know and uh, um, you know that's that is also a trend that comes into the fore um, that uh, that might be uh, impacting how we uh, kind of design buildings and uh, um, uh, what we need to th look at when uh, when designing buildings um, all right so uh, um, mostly the bottom two is like concrete and 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 uh, um, you know, uh, uh, porous materials that uh, gets placed together. But we these days you can also, you know, print metal. Uh, you can print, uh, uh, you know, most materials that you uh, that that actually uh, are printable. Um, and uh, so it's not only you know plastics and and, and that sort of thing. All right. Um, I don't know, Paul, if you want to add something. No, I'm 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 good with that, Sean. It's great. Uh, okay, great. The, uh, the the main thing with these additive, um, you know, c construction um, parts is that it's uh, there's no waste, or or there's a there's a low uh, percentage of waste, um, rather than uh, you know uh, the traditional uh, creation of you know walls and, and objects. And that's actually such a, an interesting thing in the in the in the manufacturing uh, software that is used to generate these shapes and forms. It's based on the on the quantity of an element that you would like to manufacture. It will tell you whether casting or milling or printing would be the most cost efficient solution. So even the economic side of things is also built into the Autodesk software. Right, and that's where the yeah, the, as as you said, the mechanical software, um, you know, come to the fore in an architectural environment. Yes, definitely. All right, um, good. So um, let's carry on with the with the slides. Um, this cloud-based um, idea uh, also has now come to the fore, uh, predominantly with the the COVID environment where you work at home, but. Um, it's been around in the UK and, uh, and and the US, you know, for for a while. And um, basically, what this is is, it's just, you know, in a basic form, you create your your um, your uh, designs. You upload it to, um, you know, this common data environment. Um, and this common data environment is shared with uh, with other people. Obviously, this is in the cloud, and um, there's now a uh, uh, th there's various benefits to this. Um, even the um, the client has benefits after the building is built. He can facility uh, uh, use that data to to manage his facility. Um, and uh, um, right, there's various other other benefits. I'm going to just uh, open uh, the floor up for Paul to just uh, put his input in. Yeah, so that's really just working towards the CDE or the common data environment. It's one source of truth for everybody that's involved in the project. And on the design side, that's a CDE, what they call the, uh, the, the sort of design model during the construction. We've got the as-built model. So how accurate can we construct something that we have designed? Inaccuracies, they cause trouble on site because then there are clashes and so forth. So traditionally, I mean, if you go back 20, 30 years and you have a look at how buildings were constructed, Guys would, would uh, waste one-fifth of the construction cost just on clashes on site alone. So being able to create 3D models and clash them is already going to save one-fifth of the construction cost. And that's one small part of what Bermit can deliver. And then ultimately we work towards FM management or facilities management, the, the operational cycle of that asset. And that might last 60 to 100 years, however, you know, however the building is constructed, during which we would like to use or we use the digital twin to perform things like maintenance and um, asset tracking, asset management. And that's really what the digital twin is about. And if you look at the UK government, for instance, I mean, they take this very seriously. You, you wouldn't be allowed to, to generate something without this, without generating that digital twin, which includes all sorts of information if you wanted to do work for the British government, even in Dubai, in the East, in America. All of them are now using these digital models to expand or 
make more efficient the management of built assets. Uh, they're currently building a very interesting railway line. It's in a built environment. It's not exactly a building, but it operates on the same principles, called HS2, which is a nice new railway. And they've even got a minister that is in charge of that process. But they mandate these protocols all the way from the top. And if the supply chain wants to be involved, if anybody within the supply chain wants to be involved in that process, they have to comply. But coming out of that is the efficiency, as well as the big thing is the saving of energy, and then also making money over the entire life cycle of that project. So doing this at the beginning gives us the ability to um, earn money from that built asset for the time over the entire life cycle of the, of the building, as opposed to just putting down a building and saying, all right, there's room for the documentation. That's not necessary. We can now manage that building through the cloud and on an iPad or a cell phone, if something breaks, the contractor is immediately told that something is broken by the facilities manager. They know where the problem is. They can have a look at the service manuals or the maintenance schedules if they want to come and do maintenance on a regular basis or if it's predictive so that they can get an alarm that tells them, listen, something's gone wrong in the building. You need to come and fix that. So it's all very exciting, but it's all based upon this common data environment idea. And what makes it even more exciting on the Autodesk side is the Autodesk platform is the only platform that allows us to co-author models with anybody else in the world as long as they're connected to a decent internet connection. So from personal experience, I've worked on a building in um, Australia, and the team members were everywhere from the UK to Cape Town to Australia. And they were all working in the same model at the same time. So it's, it's very exciting the fact that we can bring our own licenses to a project, be invited onto a project, and it could be anywhere in the world. So it really opens up the entire world as a source of work for us here in South Africa or wherever you are based. And then uh, you can be included in teams from wherever you need to be included from. So it's, it's really democratized the way in which we not only do business within our own town, but in the world. So it's opened up our eyes to the rest of the world and said, right, you know, we typically also these projects are moved down to places like China, India, South Africa, because our labor cost is relatively low in comparison to say London. Something in London that does the same work that we do here in South Africa, they need to get paid more. And so the way that the architectural industry is structured is also changing in that sense and there's a great opportunity for South Africa to become involved in that. Thanks, Joel. Yes, and that's uh, that's mainly in the design area. Uh, we haven't even talked about the construction area, you know. So even the um, the bigger construction, um, you know, um, uh, uh, companies, they can also get involved with this sort of um, uh, um, CDE. Um, most of them are, um, you know, are on the brink of getting involved. Um, but uh, so uh, you know, sharing the information or the design data with them to on-site go and, um, you know, get that data, always the, 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 the source of truth and um, be able to um, create snags on-site and that goes back to the design team to, fi uh, to finish and uh, uh, to fix um, and as well as the, the um, you know, the construction subcontractors. Um, and then, as, as Paul said, uh, once, you know, the building is there, you can use that same data to operate the, the building. Um, and um, you know, uh, throughout his life cycle. What's right, nice so, yeah. about the construction side, sorry, Shol, what's nice mm. about the con uh, construction side as well? Not only snags, but also RFIs, you can include that, and also checklists. So for QA and QC, typically a guy would have a subcontractor that goes onto site, they would perform some work, and now he wants to get paid. And if you have an inspector on site, and they go through the work and what's been done, and they accept that checklist and said it's done, then the subcontractor gets paid because the manager understands that it gets done. And it's all done in the cloud. You don't need to go on site. You don't need to get on your, in your car and actually drive there. You can just go and do all of that on site. And there are uh, defined protocols for these things. So we use a standard called COBE, which is a often used one. Um, it's used in America and it's used in the Middle East and also in England. And COBE is really the, then, it, as you insert assets, you would say something like, okay, you've got a big mechanical piece of equipment, you installed it. Where's the maintenance manuals? You digitize them, you upload them into the cloud. You say what the maintenance schedule must be, and that's then automated. So the guy that needs to come and service that mechanical equipment is then alerted when they must come and service those items. And all of that's done during the construction cycle. So as the equipment is coming on site, all of that data is populated for that equipment. You can see already that there's a scope for somebody that does 
data input into the model. It doesn't need to be a contractor or a subcontractor, just somebody within that, um, just as an example of a job that might be created in a situation like this, it would be as if you are sitting in a bank and entering somebody's personal information, only in this case you would be entering the information that's, that's applicable to, 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 to a certain piece of me mechanical equipment. And uh, what's nice about that also is it allows us to do data drops. So that's a typical term that you might hear. And if we do data drops, if you work, do work overseas as well, they, they can even then automate against the data drop that you create for them to see whether the supply chain has done the work that is required of them. So everything in the structured data that we are creating in the CDE is based on protocols, and those protocols allow us to automate against those models and create efficiencies and savings, and also to create new jobs for people that haven't been involved in the construction industry before. In addition, to the guys that are going to construct these buildings. Okay, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, just to bring it back to the, uh, you know, the the AEC collection, the Autodesk software. Um, within the AEC collection, there is a, a product called Autodesk uh, Docs. Um, that piece of software allow you to um, link to this uh, uh, cloud-based common data environment. However, you can't co-author with that uh, piece of software. So you you will have to uh, purchase additional software um, called BIM Collaborate or BIM Collaborate Pro. The Pro allows Revit to connect to this uh, um, co-authoring with other uh, users. So it, there is additional cost um, and uh, there's also a, a software called uh, Autodesk Build for the more the construction uh, industry and then also uh, Autodesk Takeoff uh, which allows QSs to uh, be involved in this whole process all working in this common data environment with the same data, right? And um, you know that again is a trend that uh, that is uh, you know you know in front of us. And uh, I guess uh, the only way to to uh, embrace it is to you know get into it and uh, start your next project on this uh, you know cloud-based environment. All right. Um, okay. So the uh, looking at uh, the next topic. Um, uh, VR or virtual reality. Um, it's also been, um, you know, come to the fore now with, uh, you know, with the the, the democratizing of these uh, the hardware systems. Um, um, yeah, I think of uh, I don't want to mention too many names, but uh, you know the uh, 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 the Oculus Quest um, that's untethered to the uh, machine, so you can actually just purchase this. Uh, um, this headset, you don't have to link it to a PC. Uh, it's got its own Wi-Fi and uh, um, processes built in. And uh, what this then allows initially is to play games, but um, additional uh, uh, software developers have now taken this and um, with this common data environment, your data being in the, uh, the common data environment, you can then meet with other people uh, walking through this uh, 3D model uh, and discuss certain designs and um, be and also comment on these designs. Um, it's got a, um, a speech to text uh, 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 the particular software that are uh, uh, that are uh, have investigated they've got some uh, speech to text uh, conversion so you, you as you make a note you you talk and uh, it then creates a note on that particular column or uh, you know um, uh, different um, notes that you add right um, you've also got a little menu as you see on the, on the right hand side uh, where you can you can add notes and uh, discuss uh, different things um, you'll also see there's uh, other people looking at the same column Becky and Susan as well as the the user and uh, you know they, they they can see the same information on this common data environment where your building is, right? And this is very exciting. Um, even if, uh, and uh, um, you know, uh, uh, and 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 we think that's also going to be, uh, especially with this, uh, with a COVID environment and a stay at home sort of idea. Um, this is where you would uh, perhaps meet, uh, because the data is already in the cloud. Uh, it just makes sense uh, rather than driving to the particular uh, site or redrawing the site just for the meeting. The data is already there. Um, uh, maybe your kids already have got these headsets for their games uh, and then you just use that for 
for the rest uh, um, of the meeting and uh, and in so doing you can um, speed things up uh, with regards to um, you know your your uh, weekly site meetings or even daily site meetings because you don't have to drive or you know uh, everywhere all right so um, you know I think this this is a, a a brilliant idea um, and I think that will uh, you know uh, grow in uh, you know in future uh, Paul if you want to add something no just from my side just having worked with limited virtual reality within Revit itself I can taste the fact that it's a great tool to experience the um, it's difficult to explain to somebody. You actually have to explain it yourself, but just to feel the context in which your design exists. So if you have a say a door or a space in your in your design and you want to understand how it feels to be inside that space, if you put on that virtual reality headset, you can immediately see is this design of mine going to work? Is it creating the sort of atmosphere that I want to create? And that's great. You know, so vir virtual reality it's it's not just toy, it's a way for you to be in a built asset before it's even there and that's also very exciting from another perspective just I think also harkening back on things like uh, the CDE and everything else that we've discussed before I think most of you would be familiar with images when we started with lockdown with the Wuhan uh, hospitals being built now quickly those were done so from a disaster management perspective or just from a planning perspective you'll find that there are many companies in the world that would plan projects as if they were going to be built in the real world just as an in-case scenario and in, in that sense it's not as if that built asset is going to be there it doesn't necessarily need to be there ever but it is a project on which you can experience in virtual reality what it's going to feel like to be inside of that project and that's also very exciting so just planning these projects before the time would allow us also to react much faster to challenges that come our way. And virtual reality is a great example of how you can experience that built asset without it actually existing. It's a fantastic concept. All right, great, thank you. All right, um, so basically that concludes our our session for today. Um, just the idea behind what we've discussed and the, the overall umbrella um, thought about those, um, I believe, uh, is, you know, the focus on, uh, you know, increasing efficiency, you know, even if, uh, you know, those generic, generative design, uh, 3D printing, even the, um, you know, the CDE and the, and the virtual reality, all those uh, ideas focus on energy efficiency. Uh, as well as you know, delivering the product faster and 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 quicker, um, you know, the efficiency in in time uh, spent. Um, so um, and and obviously that bodes well with uh, with the whole, the whole kind of architectural environment. Um, obviously, the more we can uh, we can complete, the more we can um, you know. Um, either you know increase our prof profitability or you know keep our customers happy um, and uh, the more we can deliver and uh, um, you know progress ourselves right so um, yes although you know the computer the power of the computer that allows this whole thing um, and uh, you know so yeah so the invitation is there um, if you want to chat uh, with us um, on these topics uh, you know we we are available and uh, you know maybe just uh, afterwards send us a, an email or uh, you've got all the information there or uh, you know you, you know Paul and I um, if uh, if you don't um, you know I'm from the PE office Paul's from the Cape Town office um, so you can just contact uh, um, you know the particular office and um, you know you know continue with the chat and um, yeah you know, so if you have any questions um, you can you can uh, uh, you know you know, unmute yourself and chat if you like or uh, just type it in the chat box um, otherwise take it offline and uh, you know discuss it later on all right so I'll open the floor I don't know um, Paul if you want to just conclude what you uh, you want to add something there no I'm just very excited about the future of architecture so <laughs> looking forward to the technology and everything else that's going to come along within the next few decades yeah certainly on uh, on our side we uh, with a with the AEC collection you know, there's lots of technologies in there, um, and uh, we hope that uh, yeah, it's going to grow, 
and uh, um, and and perhaps be um, you know you just purchase that and, and everything is in there, uh, which is great. All right, so um, I'm going to conclude. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you guys for attending, um, and we will see you uh, then on the next webinar um, that we host. So just keep your uh, your watch your emails for the next one. Um, right, and have a good day further. Cheers, everyone. Have a great day.